So we're going to talk about uh, Tango today, and uh, Merlin here will uh, dive into the internals of the entire Tango platform, but before we get to that, I just want to uh, revisit like, the history of the Tango platform and how it came to be. So we're both PhD students at uh, Ghent University in Belgium. Um, and this is actually the toy uh, that we have at our university. So these are 100 physical, um, 100 physical servers connected uh, to a 1.5 terabit switch, which allows you to create any network topology you want to have. And as you can see on the uh, slide, this is actually used what well, it was previously used for um, uh, video analysis, so video encoding and whatever you have. Um, but since we have this very big virtual wall with all these uh, fantastic nodes, um, we tried to uh, implement some big data technologies on there as well. So it's dropping sometimes, okay. Um, so we had all these servers and we wanted to install all these different uh, big data technologies on there, both analysis and storage. And the problem was is that I was spending a lot of time like, um, well, losing a lot of time configuring, installing, uh, integrating all these different technologies together. So a lot of frustration actually came from that. And um, so that's why we created the Tank Platform. It's a, it was actually a platform for researchers to uh, enable researchers to quickly build all these big data technologies and big data frameworks on our virtual wall infrastructure and get them to experiment even faster. So they wouldn't need to spend time configuring the entire stack, but just uh, go ahead and uh, experiment with their uh, algorithms that they developed. So basically what we wanted to do is like, uh, one of our exper uh, experimenters says, okay, I just want a storm cluster, and then uh, gives back the storm cluster, uh, and he wouldn't need to know that a storm cluster actually exists different services, that it needs the Nimbus, that it needs all these different workers, and that it does need, uh, that it needs the Zookeeper infrastructure as well. So basically what it became after being this tool for researchers is actually that we started using it for uh, our students as well in uh, practical exercises. So instead of teaching by the book, the students would actually be using a full Hadoop deployed uh, distributed cluster. Um, uh, and we actually saw the results of these students go up and uh, we saw that they had a better understanding of the entire thing because they had hands-on experience with all these uh, different uh, technologies. Now, I'll give the uh, mic to uh, Merlin and he will take a deep dive into how Tank was actually built and how we use Juju at Ghent University more specifically to reach what we have here. All right, so the first issue we had with Juju is that a lot of people in our research group aren't that familiar with Linux and aren't running Linux on their laptops. So what we wanted for them is to create a really easy way for them to get started with Juju and to start deploying models. So we created the search level. This is Juju as a service. You basically, via this web interface, you basically ask for a certain model, and in the back end, a new Juju client gets deployed. This client sets up a new Juju environment, um, requests all the resources, and deploys the actual model, including some nice bits, ni nice bits, such as a VPN server that VPNs inside the network where your um, big data stuff is run. So, for for people who are new to Juju. The way that Juju models um, applications looks extremely easy. Um, they're much simpler. It's much simpler to look at the Juju UI and get a concept of what is actually running than if you look at, for example, Chef, the, uh, the Chef UI, or if you have to go through your bash scripts about what's deployed. But we want to make this even more easy, because as Thomas said, like some researchers, they want to deploy a storm cluster, but they don't want to think about that a storm cluster actually also needs a zookeeper, for example, that the storm cluster consists of an Indus node and a bunch of workers. So we want to create a higher level model 
that actually shows what the researcher is thinking about. Like I want a storm and I want a storm cluster connected to an API. And that underneath, underneath it all is an actual Juju model where there is a storm cluster deployed, Apache Zookeeper is deployed, and there's a Kafka server to, to, to tie the REST API and storm together. And so then we had like these, these, these two layers. You have the Juju layer, which is basically what is running. And then on top of it, you have a logical layer of what the, the user thinks is running. And then we tried to go even further. And we tried to see if we could model the uh, actual algorithms that are running on the storm cluster. So one of our uh, master stu students has a thesis. He created a proof of concept where someone can use the Juju UI to model the actual algorithms that are running in Storm. So Storm works with a set of where um, it's, it's a streaming tool and it works by, you, you, can, you can create algorithms by creating a pipeline that's, that gets the data and that in, in, a, in a bunch of different steps transforms the data. And this is basically a graph, this is a workflow. And so this workflow can now be modeled in the Juju UI to give um, a researcher a better concept of what is actually working, what is, what is actually running. So then we have um, basically three layers. You have the, the operational layer, you have the algorithm layer, you have the connection between the algorithms and the operational layer. Because for example, a certain step in your algorithm is that the data is stored in MongoDB. And your algorithm has to know what the IP address is of MongoDB. So we use the Juju relationships to create a relationship between your algorithm and the database itself. And then you have the third layer, which is the logical layer on top of it, which is what, what the researchers think about. Storm is there and it's running and it's connected to MongoDB. So of course, this searchable Juju as a service we, we charmed everything, everything is running on Juju and is actually using a lot of the, the is a, a lot of the, the actual uh, grunt work is done by Juju. For example, um, creating, uh, a new, creating a new model is actually creating a new charm and this charm in the back end will create a new model so that our layer is, is a very thin layer on top of it. So the next thing we created was a Hauchiwa. Again, as I said, a lot of researchers are not using Linux and are not so proficient with Linux. So installing a Juju client is, um, can be quite a challenge for them. So we created a Juju client in the cloud. If a user requests a model, a Juju client is deployed. This client is connected to the actual environment and a lot of extra tools are installed. For example, the Juju plugins such as uh, DHX, which is a Juju plugin that makes it very easy to collaborate on a Juju environment. And so now the users only have to, um, most of the users are using Windows, so the users only have to install PuTTY and SSH into this box, and then they can use all the tools. So now you have to know this, the servers that Thomas was talking about. This is all part of a Pet for Fire project. This is a project that combines a lot of different test beds from all over the world into, um, well, one big super test bed. Um, there is the Path for Fire API, that's a standardized API to ask resources from these test beds. And it's possible to create one big experiment with resources over all these test tests. So that part of your servers are, for example, in America, part of your servers are in Europe, part of them are in Asia, and these are all connected. So using this project, you can, for example, do tests um, about a global ISP. Test, um, you can emulate that you are a global ISP and do tests. Um, for example, develop algorithms for that. But the issue is that this uh, ten, these testbeds are not officially supported in Juju. Um, these testbeds are all uh, to, to request resources. You have to use a, a very uh, over-engineered Java, Java library. So 
it was not easy to, to integrate it into the Juju core. So what we did was we created uh, extra tools in our Houchima that uh, leveraged the Juju manual provider and that used the, the manual provider to create Juju experiments on these test beds. So what is happening is that when a, when a Houchima gets a request to create a model, it actually, it actually first calls rest to JFAT tool, which can talk to these fat for fire test nets. It requests the resources, but then it has the resources, but these resources are a little bit different from what Juju actually, um, from what Juju expects. So we first have to install a bunch of stuff on <coughs> these servers so that they are in, they are in, the, in, in a way um, that Juju is supported on them. And so what we have to do is install a bunch of software on a bunch of servers. So what better way to do that than to use Juju? But then we have the problem that some of these, um, some of these services are not supported um, from the start of it. So we create a Juju model, but this Juju model by default does not have support for, for LXC containers. Only after we deploy certain charms, then LXC containers are supported. So we have to have a way to specify which charms have to be deployed first, and then after these charms have reached a certain state, then we can um, then we can deploy the other charms. So we created an init bundle, which is um, an extension to the normal Juju bundles, where you can specify which charms have to be deployed in what order. So now I'm going to talk about what the actual charms are that are in this init bundle. So the first charm is a networking agent. This makes sure that the network that your servers are, are in um, is in a state that Juju can work with it. So one of the things it does is, is make sure that there's a DHCP server there because that's important for the LXC containers. It is very important that there, if there is already a DHCP server on that network, then there shouldn't be one installed. So this germ checks if there is a DHCP server installed, and if it isn't, it creates a DHCP server itself. It can also act as a gateway to provide internet access, and it can also provide as a port forward. So some servers have a public IP address, and we want the services that are running on the private network to be publicly accessible. So these services can connect using a relation to the network agent and then requests that a certain IP port pair gets forwarded to the, the servers in the backend. So one of the supported topologies is that the network agent gets deployed on a server that has a public and a private IP and the internal network does not have a gateway. So then it configures itself as a default gateway and as a DHCP server and it it, it um, um, broadcasts itself as the gateway for that network. Another example is where there is already a DHCP server and, and a default gateway available, but the, the server still has a public and a private IP address, so then it will only, it will, uh, it will only be a uh, port forward. So another thing we wanted to do is use LXC containers. But these are by default not supported, not totally supported in a manual provider. So on the left you see the um, configuration that Juju does by default on a manual provider, where each container is behind a virtual uh, NOT gateway inside the server. And this means that the, the containers can connect to the internet, they can connect to other containers on the same host, but they cannot con connect to other containers on other hosts. And so what we do on the right, you see a server where the LXC networking charm is deployed. There we just bridge the network interfaces of the containers to the, network inter to the physical network interface so that the containers can request public IP, can request IP addresses on that network. And if you pair this with the network agent charm, then you can have uh, networking for your containers on the manual provider. Another thing we did 
is provide VPN access to the internal network. So we changed the VPN chart, the open VPN chart that originally was only working on Ubuntu Precise, I think, and we changed it to uh, Trusty. And then we made some modifications to it so it can punch through a bunch of firewalls. So what did we learn from this? So this, this testbed, our, our own testbed, that's part of the Fat for Fire uh, project, is running in the backend Emulab. Emulab is a project that was ori originally designed to uh, do experiments um, on, on different kinds of networks. So it's designed to set up a bunch of different kinds of networks. It can, for example, set up um, 4G links between certain servers. It can then change the latency between these 4G links. There are special kinds of boxes that can be used to, um, to create uh, interference in these networks. And Emulab can work with all that. But Emulab was not built to be a cloud, uh, a cloud scheduler. So, for example, one of the problems we have with this is that if we request a burst of machines to Emulab, then it has a certain chance to um, make um, scheduling conflicts and to crash. And so that's a problem, because what we want to do is we don't care about all these fancy network setups. We only want to, to uh, we only want to use servers. So what, what we are now doing is we're, uh, we're changing from the Emulab backend to MAS. But then, of course, our research group, the largest part of our research group is still around networking. So this Emulab infrastructure has to stay there. So what we're doing now is we're creating a way for machines to be um, to, to, to take machines out of the pool of machines managed by Amulab and to put them in the to put them in the pool of machines managed by mass. So that's one of the things we're working on now. So basically snowflakes are not good. The biggest one, one of the biggest problems that we had is that on one side the way that we are using the juju is a way that Juju is, is not tested a lot. So we are, we are finding a lot of bugs that are, with the help of the Juju team, are being fixed. But, the, but the, the issue is that we are losing some time trying to fix these bugs. Well, we actually just want to deploy the services. And then we also had a problem that because of the specifics of our infrastructure, our environments, our Juju environments, were also quite specific so that some of the charms were also payment. Um, one of the issues we had, for example, is that the host names of our servers are not resolvable, neither from the host itself or from another host. But a lot of Java tools want to use the host name to connect to other services. So what we had to do is uh, put patches in a lot of charms so that the host names get distributed so that they, they, they start to be resolvable. These fixes were very easy and, and they, they've been accepted upstream. It was very easy to do that. But the issue is that every time when we want to use a new charm, we, 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 we come up to an issue where this charm um, does not work in our infrastructure. And that's mostly because our infrastructure is, so, is such a special sh snowflake. So that's why we're now going to mass to remove the special snowflake to get to a system that's, that's a lot more standard, and that's a lot more st tested, and so that we can just use software from upstream without having to, to patch everything. So where is Tengu used? One of the examples where Tengu is used for the moment is the City of Things project in uh, Antwerp in Belgium. This project is trying to um, create a smart city to change Antwerp into a smart city by deploying a bunch of sensors all over the city that measure, for example, how many people are passing by, uh, what the temperature is, what the, the humidity is, uh, what the quality of the air is. And all these sensors all over the city are sending this data to one platform. And this one platform, we aggregate the data. And in the first uh, round of the project, we create 
an, an API, a simple API that people can use to do things with this data. So the idea is that we make it as easy as possible to get as much, as much information as possible about the city so that people can start to figure out what can we, what can we do exactly with the city. People can start creating uh, applications that use this data to do cool things for the city. So this is the back end. Of course, it's all managed by Juju. And what you have to know is that the City of Links project is a project, is a collaboration between a bunch of different research groups and a bunch of different industry organizations. So this means that there are a lot of different sensors. Each sensor communicates over its own protocol, um, decodes its, encodes its, its messages in a different way. And so what we first have to have is an ETL pipeline that standardizes all this data. So the storm is the core of this ETL pipeline. There the messages get inspected. And we look at what the message exactly is. And then we, we decode the message and we push it into MongoDB. But the issue is that storm is a pool-based system. It pulls a message, it, it uh, changes the message, and it pushes it, the message to MongoDB. But the sensors, they just want to push their data. So we have to have something in between that acts, acts, that acts as a buffer between Storm and the REST API. And that's what we use Kafka for. And then we have the actual REST API that is just a very simple configuration of the WSO2 Enterprise Service Bus, um, where we are actually, this is complete overkill. Like in the next iteration, we are going to change this component to uh, something that's, that's a lot more simple. Because for what we are actually using, the enterprise service bus, this is, this is quite overkill. So then we want to, then we have this data stored in MongoDB, all the data from all the sensors. And then we want to expose this data <coughs> over a REST API. For that we are using LimeDS which is an internal project in our research group, which, which makes it very easy to create workflows that end in a REST API, where you can, for example, get uh, information from MongoDB, aggregate it in a certain way, and expose it over a REST API. And so then this REST API is connected to the internet, and people can use this API. So we are a research institu institution. We have to learn a lot. What did we learn from this? MongoDB is actually very good for this uh, use case. MongoDB is something that, that gets a lot of hate, but it is very flexible and it's very good if you don't know what you want. And this is the case because there are a lot of different research groups and a lot of different uh, institutions working on this. And so we have no idea what, what our data model is. So we can just turn every, change everything into JSON, JSON, push it into MongoDB, and then we can search over it with, uh, in a quite performant way. But MongoDB is very hungry. For some reason, in the, the, the prototype that we set up now, we have aggregated about 10 gigabytes of data, but MongoDB stores about 200 gigabytes of meta information about that data. So the next thing we're going to do is see if we can change it in a certain way to use more disk space. But for the moment, that's not an issue because disk space is extremely cheap. What we also learned is, is that we have to give more users more power because we are doing way too much work. So one of the things we did now is that our research team is the only one who have access to this ETL pipeline. So that means that every time when a new sensor gets added to the system, we have to write a decoder ourselves. And that requires a lot of communication with the group that creates the sensor. And most of the time, the documentation is inaccurate. That creates a lot of back and forth and a lot of work for us that's not really interesting to us. So what we actually should do is just give them, in a certain way, access to the ZTL pipeline to a part where they only see their own messages and where they can create their own decoder for their own messages. And in the future, we will do this with LimeDS also. So then 
um, loading data into MongoDB will be done by LimeJS, and publishing the data onto the REST API will also be done by LimeJS. And now it's back to Thomas. So, um, based on the feedback we actually got from the industry partners and projects like uh, the City of Game Story and another project, for example, where we work with other universities to detect cyberbullying on social network sites, um, we actually got a lot of feedback from these industry partners telling, okay, um, this is a very easy way to set up any big data framework we want. So, in July of this year, so a couple of months ago, we actually founded a spin-off of uh, Ghent University uh, called Kurama with the aim of uh, actually commercializing the entire story behind uh, Tengu and aiding companies that are not uh, knowledgeable or uh, don't have a lot of experience in big data and setting up big data frameworks get to uh, new business intelligence faster. So Tengu would set up the entire thing on their particular servers or public cloud uh, with the help of Juju. And since this morning actually, uh, we're actually part of uh, the Charms Partner uh, program uh, with Canonical and so we're very excited to see where uh, the story will lead us. So if you have any more questions for now or even during uh, the rest of the summit, please do not hesitate uh, to ask us any of your questions. And so all of these charts, they're all online. The code is all, and the code of everything is online on GitHub, AGPL code. Um, if there is stuff that you would like to use, please contact us. We can work together. And we can, for example, um, collaborate to, to um, make these charts also usable for your use case, and then, for example, publish them in the store. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Canonical for inviting us to speak here and System76 for doing the awesome giveaway of the laptops and then, well, thank you and the newly created QRA. So any questions? Set up something like a bundle on our servers. No, I to create the whole system. The company, how long did it take you from the from having this idea until you got to the um, the 
story for Tang we started three years ago. Um, so before we knew anything about Juju and then uh, Merlin introduced Juju to the system. So we had a, a previous version of the platform actually worked with uh, Chef and was all based on Chef cookbooks and whatever uh, to interact. But um, the problem there is that we didn't have a lot of freedom on how we wanted users to interact with our system. Um, everything was kind of static. Yeah, it's inherently inflexible. You, yeah. you model the end state of your system. And if you want to change the end state, then you have to dive back into the cookbooks and change yeah, the cookbooks. Yeah, exactly. So that was the biggest problem we had there. And then uh, when we became aware of Juju, then we reworked actually the entire core of the model into uh, facing Juju. And that was a year ago that we did the entire move to Juju. Yeah. So a year ago and then since that move, we actually started talking about going to a spin-off company, so that took about a little less than a year, I guess. Uh, yeah, so three years in total since uh, the start of the idea. No, um, the problem was I did it during my PhD because I was doing uh, a lot of this um, research on all these technologies, like I needed uh, the Hadoop infrastructure, I needed Spark, I needed Storm, I needed all these um, database technologies because that's part for my PhD where I do research into all these different technologies and it just took me a long time when I started experimenting for like publishing a paper and it was out of that need for my own research that I started building like a primitive version of the Tango platform we have now. Um, but the thing was is that other researchers actually had the same issues and then people from uh, the bio uh, informatics group, they started using it for DNA analysis and then it just started living its own thing and then I needed to improve uh, the script based thing that I had and then Merlin came on as a PhD student after he did his master thesis uh, at our university and that just got the ball rolling into Juju and then yeah. Basically. And so we, we have one master student who created the proof of concept of Storm, yep. and we have one other colleague who is mostly working on the UI. So the UI is a form of the Neo Neo 4G UI that we, we changed a bit to to our use case. And so that's the the, the re real team of three. Yeah. Basically. And the company has uh, two open vacancies right now. <laughs> Throwing it out there, so. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so yeah, the company, two new people, and then the thesis students actually uh, accepted the job at the university for a PhD, uh, maybe. So he'll be starting in a couple of weeks as well. So the team will grow to six, seven people in like a couple of months, basically. that we simply have uh, a bunch of a bunch of models that currently have two um, layers. You specify everything. You specify which layer is visible to the researcher and which layer is visible, well, which layer gets translated to Juju. But the idea is that um, with more research, we will be able to change this, this in a way that the, the charms can actually decide themselves what is actually shown to the user and what is shown to, um, and what, what, how that gets translated to, for example, Juju. But for the moment, that's, that's very simple. We just create a set of uh, models that have, that have an accompanying uh, higher level model. So the basic thing is that we, we want to hide some stuff, but we don't want to take any capabilities away from users because um, you have a lot of people that are interested in how the entire thing works down to like a command level or whatever command line um, so it's actually like the different job description of like having a data scientist focused on developing algorithms business intelligence what have you and the 
data engineer, the guy that actually sets up the entire framework. And it's like the data engineer can do his job much faster and the data scientist doesn't have to deal with all the stuff that's been needed. So we want to bring those two a little bit closer together. The, the Juju mo model is, is extremely easy compared to the other things that a, that a, a system administrator uh, is, is currently using but it's still too low level for what a real data scientist is using. A data scientist only cares about, I want Hadoop, and I want something to run queries on Hadoop. And so that's, that's, we want to give them that power with the flexibility of Juju, where, where for example, most platform as a services today have certain uh, um, solution tailored towards data scientists, but I lose the flexibility. There is either our solution works for you and you use this one, or it doesn't work for you. But like the the thing about big data is that one 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 size does not fit all. Big data is about a lot of different tools that are very good in specific parts of the big data workflow. So where the, 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 the general platform as a service model really falls through where there is a big need for something a lot more flexible, but at a level that a data scientist can understand. Building SaaS on demand. You know, yeah, yeah. Data scientists are building a custom SaaS offering on demand yeah. for what they're going through and yeah. they want to consume. Very cool. And so if you are interested, if, if you want to work with us, yeah. uh, we have open job positions. And if you are interested in some of the tools, if you think you can use it for your for in your own company, please contact us. We are very open to collaboration.